Hello, everybody, and welcome to the CUGH webinar series. Today's webinar is COVID-19 Pandemic, A View from New York State. I'm Dr. Keith Martin, the Executive Director of the Consortium of Universities for Global Health. We know that New York State is at the epicenter of the pandemic that's affecting the United States. As of today, April 2nd, it has only six days supply of ventilators and it is represented the state uh, includes nearly half of the number of people who are currently dying of the, of the virus. New York is in fact the face of what may well come to other parts of the United States and other countries. So we created this webinar to share with you three experts from New York who are gonna share with us some important aspects of what they're faced with. And the purpose of this webinar is to draw attention to New York's urgent needs, what's required in terms of personal protection equipment, ventilators, people, testing kits, and infrastructure, and to inform the federal government of what the state and indeed the United States needs now in order to save people's lives. And we also hope that the, what you're going to hear today is going to help other countries in their effort to combat the pandemic. We hope also that what we'll learn today will actually prevent the spread of the disease, protect healthcare workers, and also enable all who need it to access the care that they require. So I'm very pleased to let you know today that the three experts we have today, in the order in which they'll speak, are Dr. Cheryl Hilton. Dr. Hilton is the Dean of the School of Global Public Health at New York University. Dr. Hilton is going to talk, give us an overview of the current situation in New York. She'll be followed by Dr. David Holtgrave. Dr. Holtgrave is the Dean and Empire Innovation Professor at the School of Public Health at the University of Albany in New York. And finally, Professor Eli Rosenberg, an Associate Professor at the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of Albany, will talk to us about the trajectory of the pandemic and the models they're using. So I'm going to turn it over right now to Dr. Hilton, who will be our first speaker. Dr. Hilton, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Martin, for having us and especially welcome on, uh, on this day that we're facing such a difficult circumstance here in New York State and around the country and indeed around the world. Um, the remarks that I'm going to make uh, to open this up are uh, our compliments to our and from our governor, uh, Andrew M. Cuomo, who has been do providing daily briefings to everyone here in New York as the pandemic has tragically unfolded um, in New York. Um, next. Just to give you a flavor, yesterday's headlines greeted New Yorkers when they woke up that the um, city was now offering, the city and state offering Rikers Island inmates $6 per hour to dig mass graves as the COVID-19 death toll outstrips the, avail the availability and abilities of the normal systems. Next. And of course, many have seen the headlines around the country that we have had to expand the ability to manage um, morgue functions by attaching long trucks and tents to various hospitals around New York City. Next. We have an increase in daily new positive cases. Um, as you can see, occasionally from one day to the next, it vacillates. Uh, this is essentially, as you'll hear later from Dr. Holtgrave, driven by the fact that our testing is largely at the point of service for those individuals who are uh, experience some symptoms that are associated with COVID. Next. We have, at this point, uh, tested over 200,000 New Yorkers, um, newly tested just in the last day, reported another 18,000. Next. We have, at this juncture, a total of 92,381 positive cases, and just in one cycle of a day, 8,669 new cases. Numbers are truly staggering. Next. So of this 92,381 tested positive, 13,383 people are currently hospitalized. And you can note that there was a 1,157 increase in those hospitalized in a single day. ICU patients are now at 3,396. That's up 
by 374 in a single day, and we've had 7,434 patients discharged, an increase in a single day of 1,292. Next. The number of deaths just reached 2,373, up in a single day from 1,941. Next. Newly hospitalized, total of new hospitalizations each day. You can see the pattern uh, there, occasional ups and downs, but a generalized overall upward trend. Next. Um, the change in daily intubations, as you can see, and when Dr. Martin opened this, he pointed to the fact that our governor today said we were six days away from having insufficient ventilator capacity um, in New York State. Um, daily intubations running anywhere between two and 300,000, I'm sorry, two and 300. Next. Basically, the state um, has, has embraced a bifurcated mission that our governor is um, motivating us all to be 100% behind. That is, the front line of the battle is our hospital system, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. And the troops, we're all in it together, and the social responsibility is to stay at home. It's the only socially responsible thing to do, to put the brakes on the epidemic to the maximum extent possible. Um, other than critical workforce individuals. And without that, we cannot um, lower the uh, pace of um, the stress on the hospital system. Next. The frontline hospitals, um, that we have to follow the projections of experts. We have to face the fact of what kind of a trajectory we are looking at. We need to aggressively procure, procure equipment. We need to identify beds and expand bed capacity. And we need to support the frontline staff who are um, clearly inundated by the epidemic. The good news is we called for retirees to come forth and 85,000 health workers have come forth. 21,000 of those are from outside of the state and the remainder are New York State retirees. Next. Um, the main battle, as our governor repeatedly tells us on a daily basis, is the battle is at the apex of the curve. While we can see the apex in sight, we are not certain when and where that apex will be. But in order to win that battle, we have to plan now, we have to have staffing plans now, we have to have a stockpile of equipment now, and we have to have social acceptance of the time expectations for how long we will be in this battle, which will not be something that will involve um, Easter celebrations in groups. Next. The function and plan is to work as one system. Um, many states in the United States have a similar problem to the United States where they, I mean, to New York, where hospital systems sometimes work well together, but often are so competitive with one another, it's hard to get them to work together. The governor, I think, has successfully brought everyone to the table to say, the days of competing with one another are over for the duration of this epidemic. Next. In New York State, we have, in New York City in particular, but also in New York State, we have two systems. New York City has a large New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. I think it has about 12 acute care beds, uh, acute care hospitals within the system. Um, and then we have the Greater New York Hospital Voluntary Hospital System. And these are, have to work together, the voluntary hospitals with the public hospitals in order to bear the brunt of this epidemic. Next. We also have the added complexity and the added pleasure of having had some federal response in um, fitting out the Javits Center uh, with 20, I believe 2,500 beds. And then the USS Comfort, another large number of beds and in the planning stages and soon to open up our 1,000 bed facilities in um, multiple um, boroughs within New York and counties. Each of those, as I said, would have a thousand uh, capacity of a thousand. Next. So in summary, we know what we have to do. We just have to do it. We have to have individual discipline. We have to have government skill and high performance. We need extreme social stamina, and we need to keep and maintain hope and national unity. So thank you for your time. And uh, Dean Holtgrave, can you take it from here? Thank you.
Great. Thank you very much, Dean Hilton. And uh, thank you to Dr. Martin and uh, CUGH for having us for this very important discussion. I'm uh, honored to participate. And uh, on the next slide, um, I'd like to uh, say that I'll organize uh, all of my remarks actually about uh, around uh, one comment that Dr. Anthony Fauci made uh, two days ago at a White House briefing on uh, coronavirus. And in that briefing, um, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks, and others were reviewing um, some mathematical models of uh, what would have happened to the number of deaths in the United States had there not been intervention and what would likely happen uh, with the level of intervention that we see now. And with the level of intervention that we see now, um, the models range from estimating 100,000 deaths uh, to about 240,000 uh, deaths. Uh, over the next few months. And uh, one particular uh, model, the IHME model from Washington, uh, it would estimate a little over 90,000 deaths. Um, of those, uh, about 16,000 to about 21,000 uh, would be estimated to be in New York State. So really quite staggering numbers to think about um, that kind of uh, uh, prediction. And in the context of reviewing those models, Dr. Fauci uh, said, and I'm slightly paraphrasing here, uh, that while we must prepare for 100,000 or more deaths in the United States, we do not have to be prepared to accept it. And I thought that was incredibly important, uh, his point that we don't have to be prepared to accept it every day. There may be some steps that we can take to do even better. The models bake in what we're doing now, uh, and what we're doing now is important and useful and good but it could be made even better. And on the next slide, I'd like to go through uh, about a total of uh, nine thoughts uh, that I think might be uh, important for us to continue to push forward. If we're not gonna accept this 100 or 200,000 deaths over the next few months in the US, uh, what are some things we could do? And I think one is um, now we have physical distancing in place. Uh, where people are asked to stay at home, uh, to avoid going to school, to stay six feet or more apart. Um, and clearly the directive is out there in New York, but it's not true in every state in the United States yet um, for people to practice physical distancing. But Dr. Sanjay Gupta from CNN said a couple of days ago something I thought was really important. He said he thought that people were too often looking for what he called loopholes. Uh, and uh, by loopholes, things like, well, you know, uh, I'd like to play basketball. It'd be okay if I went and played with a group of my friends. That would be all right. Or maybe I could just go to a colleague's house and have dinner there. and Maybe that would be okay. And we're kind of looking for how we can get exceptions to the rule. And uh, a good example of how this has played out in New York City is the playgrounds were actually too crowded. Uh, people were not practicing social distancing or physical distancing as much uh, as was necessary. And so finally now the playgrounds have had to be closed. And uh, one, I think, leads with voluntary measures, but sometimes has to move to more mandatory measures. So uh, we can, we're doing well with physical distancing, but we can do even better. Um, secondly, uh, I think it's important for us to distinguish between physical distancing and maximizing our social connection. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm on a little bit of a campaign <laughs> to encourage people to stop saying social distancing because at this time, both for improving mental health, but also to support each other's uh, health and well-being, uh, we need to find ways to be as socially connected as we possibly can. And largely it's through things like this uh, webinar that we're uh, doing this evening where we're uh, connecting with each other. But whether it's through online concerts or checking on people who are older or have an underlying health condition or finding ways to, to work with and support each other, um, can be incredibly important. And so I think we have to keep in mind that uh, we do have to do physical distancing, but we have to maximize social connection at the same time. Uh, thirdly, um, I think a, a best practice that was uh, utilized in South Korea that we haven't done much of in the United States uh, is what I would call kind of micro level health screening. So uh, we saw many reports of uh, in South Korea if you uh, that w who had a tremendous um, early testing and very widespread testing and contact tracing. 
But if, for instance, you were to go into a restaurant or some other essential business, uh, there might be a check uh, to see if you have a temperature before you go in. And so there were these kind of widespread uh, attempts to check even for whether or not someone uh, was running a temperature and whether or not you could gain access to a particular business might depend on whether or not you were running a temperature. And we really haven't seen much in, in that regard. So that might be something we could consider adding to our armamentarium. Um, fourthly, and I think very importantly, um, the data that Dean Hilton uh, presented uh, show very clearly that in New York State, but especially in New York City, the testing that's being done is very largely diagnostic in nature. Uh, to get a test, you have to be symptomatic uh, for COVID-19, and you have to be either hospitalized or in the process of becoming hospitalized, or you're a healthcare worker. And those are two important priorities, absolutely. Um, but if you uh, have moderate symptoms, you have a uh, cough, some shortness of breath, fever, and you come forward seeking a test, um, as long as you feel like you could um, maintain yourself at home, uh, you're likely not to get a test. And that that is really quite important. We need very urgently to be able to expand our testing to the point um, that we uh, have a better sense of what the contours of the epidemic are. And what I mean by that is uh, just if you do some division on the data that uh, Dean Hilton presented, uh, in New York City, uh, cumulatively, if you divide the number of cases by the number of tests, uh, the positivity rate is about 49% cumulatively. And in the last day, if you do that division, it's about 59%. So if you get a test in New York City, because it's being used in those diagnostic ways, there's about a 59% chance uh, that it will be positive uh, for coronavirus. And I, I think uh, that's really important. We need to be able to get to a place uh, again, another best practice from South Korea where you can look at uh, how the number of cases peaked and then went down over time, but they kept testing at a high rate. And so you had some confidence that as the number of cases went down, um, that they were still looking, the testing was still out there. And uh, uh, additionally, it's very important for us to be able to do enough testing that we really have a sense of where the front end of the epidemic is, how cases are being transmitted in the community. But that also will let us look at health disparities, which are incredibly important. And when we think about uh, some of the health disparities and social determinants that we learned so much about from the HIV epidemic, things like being unstably housed or homeless, being food insecure, uh, not having access to health insurance, uh, these are really going to be incredibly important, I think, in COVID-19 as well. But we need to really expand testing in a major way uh, in order to be able to first identify those health disparities, and then to be able to move toward trying to build health equity and address them. On the next slide, I just wanted to offer a few more ideas before turning it over to my colleague. Um, I uh, think that we have to also uh, reinvigorate our efforts on contact tracing. Uh, we need to expand our testing efforts, as I was just talking about before, uh, but we also have to do even more in the way of contact tracing. Certainly, that's ongoing now. Uh, but there's really not enough public health system capacity. We think a lot about the medical system capacity and how many ventilators and ICU beds and hospital beds we have, and that's incredibly important. But we also have to think about the capacity of the public health system and do we have enough people um, to be able to not only uh, help with uh, testing, but how to do the contact tracing work uh, after the fact as well, too. So I think there's even more that we can do there. Um, Next, I think that uh, we want to look at rapid studies of potential therapies. Um, at the universities that are represented on this call today are involved in partnership with uh, the Department of Health in some important studies looking at uh, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, chloroquine. Uh, here at UAlbany, uh, Dr. Rosenberg and I are very involved in a, a study that I would call observational in nature, trying to look at uh, it, right now, as the shipments of those drug supplies are being uh, brought in from the federal government, how are they being prescribed by physicians? How are they being utilized? What do we see at the outset in terms of side effects? And do we see any major initial signal uh, in the way of potential effects on uh, like length of stay and um, uh, admission to the ICU and fatality and, and other key uh, outcome measures? And I think it's important to have those kinds of uh, very quick 
uh, observational studies that are uh, strong on timeliness, but they're um, less good in terms of control in pairing them with randomized control trials. Um, Third, uh, I think we have to continue to expand our hospital surge capacity. Uh, you saw from the slides how many temporary hospitals are being built all around. One point I just wanted to add to that is I think um, a practice which to me uh, mimics something that was done in China where uh, some hospitals in China were designated to be focused on fever. And if you had a fever, you would know to go to a particular hospital and others not so much uh, focused on fever. Um, it, here now, like uh, State University of New York downstate campus, uh, that hospital will be an all COVID-19 hospital. So every patient in there in the coming days will be a COVID-19 patient. And that'll be uh, incredibly important for uh, helping the healthcare providers to know what they're encountering, to triage the patients better, uh, to be able to handle the personal protective equipment, and then for other hospitals as well, too, um, that the healthcare providers will know what the patient mix looks like. So I think that's a, an important distinction that's being made. Uh, second last, I would just say, I think we need to continually, uh, creatively produce uh, personal protective equipment for healthcare workers and uh, and eventually beyond for other people. Now there's beginning to be more discussion about the use of masks, about we don't want to take masks away from healthcare workers, but maybe people could sew their own. And there's been some debate on whether that's useful or not. Uh, but uh, now we're into the era I would call harm reduction of uh, whether or not it just it, something to, to try if there's some reasonable evidence to, to, to do that. Um, but we need sources from very large to very small, and we're hearing lots of reports throughout New York State about almost every 3D printer someone's trying to help uh, build either pieces of ventilators or they're trying to help uh, build um, face shields for healthcare workers. And so every uh, 3D printer, every needle and thread we can use to help in this regard. And also, I would just close by saying we need to bring all of the above to scale and not stop until the metrics move to the necessary levels. And Dr. Fauci also talked last evening about uh, hitting the accelerator and staying on the accelerator until we get to where we need to go. We can't let up on being uh, willing to do that. So um, I wanted to really organize all of my comments around that one uh, note from Dr. Fauci when he said we may be confronting 100,000 or more deaths but we don't have to be prepared to accept it. And I think that's true and we have to devote ourselves to that uh, literally every hour, every day in New York City, New York State, the US and around the globe. So with that, I'll conclude and turn to my colleague, um, Dr. Eli Rosenberg, Eli. Great, thank you, Dana. Um, so I'm gonna uh, round out the presentations here by talking about how we're using um, data and models to understand where this is going um, here in New York, um, but really uh, in other states um, and around the world. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the models that are the, what their projections for New York. Um, and really, uh, Dean Holgrave and I are, are both uh, working very closely with the State Health Department as part of the COVID-19 response team and involved in a lot of conversations around this topic. Um, next slide, please. So um, it's very, uh, it's been pretty uh, uh, interesting to see models and modelers really be at the front and center of a public health response and at the center of this pandemic. Usually it's more of a behind the scenes kind of work. Uh, people may have seen graphs like those in the upper left um, where there's uh, that very tall curve, uh, very tall curve to the left, which is uh, under a no intervention scenario representing how many cases and deaths we might see at what we've called the apex or the peak so far. And the real, the whole name of the game that we're trying across many strategies is to flatten that curve to look at something more like to the right where we spread cases out over time have hopefully fewer deaths and overwhelm the system less um, this is very much these kind of models have very much translated into policy discussion so on the right upper right side is a, a screenshot that we've already seen today talking about strategies uh, really about uh, that are aimed at uh, fixing that apex as it were or dealing with that apex and then to, on the bottom is a screenshot from the New York Times um, reflecting the day that the 100,000 uh, deaths number that uh, Dr. Holgrave just talked about came out. And we really see, again, this, that these kind of models are um, front and center, literally, in, our, in, uh, in, this, in this battle. Next slide, please. So uh, I just want to talk about why and how we use these kinds of models to inform our work. So why do, why do, why do we care suddenly about models? Well, things have looked 
uh, bad or, or uh, so far, but they're not quite catastrophic yet. And the models are letting us see into the future. And um, they help us understand the future impacts of COVID-19 on both our human population and also, of course, very importantly, the healthcare system. And when we have good models, we can ask what if style questions to help us plan our policies and our resources. We can look at them under, uh, we, can, we can look at those policies and resources under different scenarios of intervention. So if we try X versus Y, um, it also lets us probe different assumptions about COVID-19, uh, biology, and how it behaves in the U.S. Uh, setting. Um, for both of these, we have very thin, thin empirical data. This is a new, um, this is a new uh, emerging uh, problem, and all the data is still catching up with us. So we need to probe how things change under different scenarios and assumptions. And the other, of course, is that there's different rea data realities on the ground. Different states are different. Even within New York, there's many different settings, and we need to have models that let us understand uh, what's going on under these different uh, data realities, as I would call it. Next slide, please. So in a very high level way, when we talk about a model, what are we talking about? What are the ingredients? Well, models come uh, mechanically uh, structured as statistical models, or what I call simulation models. People may have seen the terms SEIR or agent-based or individual models. These are all different kinds of tools, uh, uh, tool frameworks through which people make these models. Into these models go many assumptions um, around, as we talked about, sort of uh, the, bi the biology and sort of the social ways through which um, this, this, the SARS coronavirus 2 uh, virus spreads. Um, so for example, how long can people transmit? How long are they asymptomatic and so forth? These assumptions uh, are all very key pieces inside these models. And you may have noticed that we may, people might look at many different outcomes in, across models. And I think this is very important. When we look at, across every, everyone's different curves, we need to be very cognizant of the outcomes that are being shown. Are they tracking infections, hospitalizations, ICU, uh, ICU stays, or deaths, or other outcomes that are important to us? Another important thing to keep in mind when you're looking at these models and results is what scenarios of intervention are being shown. Is it a base sort of no intervention situation or are there different interventions that are being assumed and compared and contrasted against each other in a, a base scenario? I will show an example or two of this in a moment. Next slide, please. So here is a very uh, uh, important uh, set of uh, models and projections that have come out from the Imperial College of London. Many people have, may have seen this paper that focused on the trajectories of COVID-19 uh, in the United Kingdom and in the United States. And this is uh, one slide uh, showing their projections for the United States uh, under different scenarios that are in different colors here. So the left side is showing uh, what they call the do-nothing scenario, and I call it sort of a base uh, situation showing that you in the United States, across the entire United States, over 200, uh, over 200 per 100,000 ICU beds uh, will be needed at a pe at peaking around June 20th, and then through different uh, social st social strategies and public health strategies, we can shown in the orange and in the green, we can slide and move those. Uh, we can both diminish the height of the peak, but also slide it down further in time, giving us more critical moments to prepare. Very importantly is that red horizontal line showing our actual system capacity. for uh, to, And so what's really, I think, an important lesson here is that uh, under all three interventions shown here, we exceed our capacity in the United States um, uh, for, for, ICU, for ICU beds. And that's very sobering results that we need to, we need to, um, yeah, we need to uh, address. Uh, next slide, please. I think what's very important when we look at these models is geography is everything. This, these epidemics are springing up in very localized ways. This is another screenshot from that paper showing every U.S. state in the model. It's a little hard to see it because it looks like a ball of spaghetti, but every state is actually peaking at a very different time. And I believe the leftmost one peaking earliest is New York State. Um, where we're all uh, housed here and, and discussing today. And that is actually uh, the peak that they're showing here is in the, I would say, in the nexus between late April and late May. And I'll show you some newer data that updates this, but it's a full month different uh, and earlier than the results we just saw for the United States on the, and the others, and we, we see for other states here on this slide. So uh, where, you know, it's not sufficient to even consider the entire country. We need to look at very local settings within a state or even places within New York State. Uh, next slide, please. 
Here's another model from a website called COVID Act Now. This one's received a little bit less attention, but just to show you, there's lots of different models, each saying slightly different things. This website has the advantage of sort of always feeding in new data as it comes out on the ground, um, and so uh, can be a little more uh, nimble than the Imperial College work. And just to say, show again here, this is a showing uh, how many hospitalizations are needed rather than ICU uh, beds in specific. Uh, but showing here that at the peak, which they're showing actually uh, uh, in, in the middle of April, uh, we'll need over 400,000 um, hospital beds under what they're calling limited action. And then notice here, the way to diminish that peak is through, they're, they're showing different three months of, of shelter in place type uh, recommendations. And notice the dashed line there is still showing the hospital capacity and we're greatly exceeding it under these scenarios. So notice that this is an earlier peak than the Imperial College model, but it's also being updated with new data that might be informing that. Uh, next slide, please. And I just wanted to show a last model, which has received a lot of attention. I'll call it the White House model. That's really the model that was developed by IHME um, in Washington state that has was used by the, by the federal government um, in, as part of their recent results around 100,000 100, or more deaths um, in the United States. And I'll, uh, this model um, shows many types of outcomes here. I'm showing, again, hospital beds to keep it sort of consistent with the earlier slide. Notice that they are they show perhaps even slightly earlier peak than the other model. They're showing that we're going to really be at our uh, maximum height on April 9th. Um, that doesn't mean we're going to be out of the woods on April 10th, right? We still have the entire other side of the curve uh, to deal with after our hospital system has already been overwhelmed. So the entire other end of that curve is going to be quite troublesome uh, for us all. I want to just point out one very important thing about this is about this model, um, and, and as it's applied to New York or to the entire country. Um, is that what's assumed is very important. And so if you, someone could just advance uh, one click, uh, there's a very important thing uh, on this slide, which is they assume uh, continued social distancing through the end of May 2020. So that's uh, we're just start we just started April, and the, our uh, country's economy and society have taken have had quite a toll taken out on them in, in just a few weeks of closure. This model is assuming a yet another two months of, of of very large amounts of closure in our country, and even then we still have a very very significant amount of mortality um, and other uh, untoward outcomes. So. Uh, this it's very important to always be mindful of what are the interventions uh, that are being assumed as we compare models. This is uh, uh, just something to keep in mind as we interpret information coming out from these models and from different parts of our government. Uh, next slide, please. So I just want to have, just leave a few takeaways uh, uh, for all thinking about comparing models. It's very easy when we look at these different types of models to wind up with an apples versus oranges uh, type of scenario. So I, I uh, encourage you as you interpret lots of information coming out in the media or in the scientific literature um, or from certain uh, parts of our government to pay close attention to the specific outcomes that are being shown in a model, the specific assumptions and the interventions that are, that are being displayed. Uh, the other important point that I hit on earlier is we have very important variations in the epidemics that are going on between our states in the United States and even within New York states. Within across different counties of the state, we're projecting different timings of those of those peaks and different needs over time. And that might suggest a very differentiated strategy and also a, a resource shifting strategy to different parts of our state. I think another important thing is that all these models have a very limited shelf life. We're learning more every day about how this virus behaves and we're always getting new data. The older models are less useful now. And really as time goes on, all these models start to converge on each other and start to converge on the truth as we learn more and get closer uh, to that apex and, and deeper into this epidemic. What I think it's also important is that while models show differences, they all really converge on a very sobering truth that we are, we are likely to vastly exceed our existing healthcare resources in the next few months, and many lives are gonna be affected. The models simply differ by exactly when, when, which week of April or which week of May, but, and, and by how much. But the fact is we're, uh, we're almost uh, certainly gonna be in a very grave situation in these coming weeks, according to basically every model that's been produced by the scientific community. Next slide. Uh, 
I want to just send, say one other piece, because I think this has been very important and perhaps missed in the headlines, which is that we, um, you know, we, we may be uh, pre, pre, sort of too early celebrating uh, some of the successes of different strategies. So here's a, a clip on the left from the Los Angeles Times showing how the social distancing strategies in California um, may be sort of, sort of flattening out the curves and maybe we're succeeding. But I think there's another, uh, the other side of this coin is that we're already starting to see a second wave of cases in, in uh, certain Asian uh, uh, societies as they are reopening following the, uh, the implementation of those strategies. The fact is, is that uh, these, many of our strategies really only buy us time, but they're not gonna eradicate uh, this disease from the earth. And I think that's really an important lesson that the current tools um, that we have the current medical tools and one one sort of prolonged period of mitigation um, that are not enough, and the models are really can help us understand that. And, and that COVID nineteen is really going to would will simply bounce back, and the main force that could stop it is population level immunity from earlier infection. And so the models can help us really think about that long game, not just about the short term strategies, but really where is this going to go? How are we get, where are we going to be in a year? And how do we really preserve our life, our our, our, our human life? and resources in that period. And so on the next slide, you know, just as one extreme example from that earlier Imperial College paper, this was a, uh, I would call a possible but impractical approach to managing our way through this epidemic over the coming year. This is showing in the blue lines where it goes high is our periods of closure and then the, in the gaps in between are when society uh, reopens and cases come back and then there's closure again and so forth. This on off switch may be one of our most uh, effective ways using our current toolbox to control this epidemic. But the fact is after that first period of closure, if we don't have a, an ongoing strategy, we will see a bounce back. And that's uh, a very uh, uh, troubling reality that the models can let us plan for. And we need to think about what are we gonna do for that second and third wave? Um, and how do we have the right tools available to us at that time? Um, so again, models I think are very important for helping us see where we need to be going. Um, and that's really my final thought. I'd like to hand it back over to uh, Dr. Marnin uh, to, for the, to handle the Q&A section. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosenberg. Uh, all of your presentations were, were superb. And so all of you online, please feel free to send in your questions and we'll get right into them right now. So the first one, uh, Dr. Hilton, is for you. And the question is, how did we get so flat, how were we caught so flat-footed with regard to this pandemic, not only in the US, but around the world? Well, that's a that's a great question, and 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 some sometimes I find myself being uncomfortable being a public health professional and saying exactly that question: How is it? And of course, I think many people on the call probably know that uh, this was not a black swan event. We have known that a pandemic like this could happen, and many many efforts uh, were undertaken uh, to try to address it. Um, Post SARS efforts were undertaken to try to um, address the point of immersion uh, w w when a new emergence, I mean, when a new epidemic begins in any location and to be certain that if it is the type of epidemic and most are amenable to being squashed at the point of emergence, that that was a goal. For a variety of reasons, not unlike SARS, this sadly did not happen in this case. We've had multiple groups trying to work on um, expanding the national capacity with respect to ventilators. And that too, it, certainly in the United States, based on what I've read, has been highly problematic. Um, and I think we've had a failure of leadership, and I don't mean just governmental leadership. I mean leadership across the board to really say, okay, this is gonna happen at some point, and what do we do? Now, every, probably many countries have a plan about what they're going to do, but we have learned through this experience that the old adage, the best laid plans of mice and men, whatever plan we have, it's not working. And there are many key elements of it, but the, the most important one is one, the original problem and our ability to corral it. And secondarily, we certainly have learned in the United States that our ability to have a laboratory response 
is completely suboptimal for the type of epidemic that is best addressed even once it has become community spread by separating and quarantining, self-quarantine, those who are positive and unwell from those who are not. Right now in the United States, we I'm sure have families commingling together thinking they're safely, they're safely um, staying at home just with their immediate family. And as we've learned in other parts of the world, that's a, a primary place for the transmission, by no means the sole place. So we have we have kind of it's it's going to be a classic case study forever. And and if this isn't the wake up call for how the world manages a pandemic, I don't know what is. So that's kind of my answer. I I I'm I feel that um, on multiple levels in multiple sectors, uh, we have um, functioned suboptimally. Thank you, Dr. Hilton. And and that is a, is a wonderful segue into the next question, which Dr. Holgrave, I'll ask you this question. And it, and, and it goes, we're looking forward. As we look forward, we've seen SARS, MERS, H1N1, we've, we've got uh, COVID-19 now. Looking forward, what does the U.S. and what does the world need to do to be able to fortify itself to prevent, detect, and respond to future pandemics? Well, thank you, Dr. Martin. It's a it's a great question, and uh, uh, and I uh, uh, convey greetings from my dogs in the background as well as we're all physically distancing here. So apologies for the interruption from them. Uh, but I think this is a terrific question, and I think that uh, and it builds in many ways, um, as you said, on on the first question about how did we get sort of caught so flat-footed, and how do we avoid doing that again in the future? And uh, I think that um, when we look. Um, uh, at the public health system, um, it, it's kind of like the electrical grid. You don't really notice it very much day in and day out until the power goes out, and then you're quite struck, and it changes uh, changes so many aspects of your life or, or the water system or any other kind of infrastructure that we sort of take for granted day in and day out uh, until it's not there. And I think and hope, um, and I think this builds on something that Dean Hilton said, uh, we really have to make a priority for uh, it, having public discussions about an investment in uh, how are we doing in terms of our stockpiling, our strategic planning, uh, making sure that we're ready for these things to go. And I think an important question for everyone to be uh, asking of themselves and leaders and the, the medical and public health system is um, over the past year, what kind of planning have we done? How ready are we for this and how will we go forward? And uh, it's, it's often difficult to say we want to invest resources that may be scarce uh, in something that's not going to be used today, but we need to build a stockpile and be able to be ready to use them in the future. So I think that matters. I think the other is um, more quickly moving through kind of different phases of confronting this. I think uh, uh, with COVID-19 kind of nationally, there was a first this initial period maybe of denial then a period of underestimation uh, then a period of um, trying to assume that we can control it, that, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, we, we'll be able to make sure that it, it does not spread further. And, and related to that, I think, was an underestimation of what, what does exponential growth really mean on some of these uh, these curves, and that if you know where you're at today, um, you know where you're going to be in the future, and that, of course, is not the same thing. And then finally, getting to a phase where uh, we recognize the severity uh, of really what's happening and are willing to take kind of the major steps that are uh, uh, needed um, to address uh, this pandemic. And so I think uh, moving through those stages and in fact skipping them in the future would be very helpful so that we kind of go to that last piece uh, without uh, spending time uh, in some of those other phases as well. So those are just a couple of thoughts, Dr. Martin. Great. Thank you, Dr. Holgrave. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg, a question comes from why was New York City the epicenter in the United States for the that's, outbreak? That's a great question and one I think will be uh, lots of research will be done after this is over to really deep, more deeply explain. I mean, I think um, as Dr. Healton laid out, the amount of density and interconnectedness in New York City um, 
is really remarkable as uh, as I get stressed out walking on the streets normally in Manhattan just because there's it's so much there's so many people on sidewalks and places right and that the, the density of living spaces is so high so I think that's almost surely a, a very important contributing factor um, it's a very mobile community both uh, right many people uh, are move move in and out of the New York City metro area throughout its region so that also explains why we see very high numbers in Westchester counties, Nassau, Suffolk, uh, Northern Jersey, um, other places where people commute to and from the city are also very, very highly impacted. That sort of verifies the travel piece. And of course, it's a very uh, international city. So it, that uh, may explain uh, surely some of how it may have been introduced uh, from other parts of the world originally. So um, I, I think there's, there's gonna be many pieces to that. In other parts of New York State where um, the density is less, where the commuting is sort of less uh, less great, we are seeing lesser epidemics and sort of uh, more seemingly, uh, though we can't say it for sure, seemingly uh, some evidence that the mitigation strategies um, are slowing the growth of the epidemic, whereas the threshold seems to be uh, different in New in New York City in, in, in the metro area that the, that the, we have to have a more perhaps more uh, intense measures to stop spread and so that sort of verifies some of these issues of interconnectedness uh, but the answer in the short term is we don't know um, those are the most probable uh, aspects based on what we know from how uh, these things tend to behave. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg. Um, Dr. Hilton, this question comes from Francisco, and I'm going to bundle it with another question. And it relates to uh, Francisco wants to know um, what advice can you give to uh, low to middle income countries who that already have uh, overwhelmed healthcare systems? And if you could also, as a as a public health expert, just share with us the the need for investing in public health here in the U.S. and, and around the world. Uh, public health is the runt of the litter in investments, mm -hmm. and that doesn't align with the disease burden that the world is faced with. So I'll start with the last one. Um, as it is often described here in the U.S., uh, funding for public health is a rounding error on the health budget, and I think that has always been true for the entire length of my career. Um, and I think it is frequently uh, the problem in other um, both uh, well-off countries as well as low and middle income countries, there is a um, attraction to hospital beds and there's a, an attraction to acute care and primary care in the hospital setting or other settings. And there's an under, a chronic underinvestment in um, preventing things from ever happening in the first place. That's a nice segue into my advice. My advice is um, to uh, do anything and everything uh, that can be done to adhere to the lower cost prevention approaches, frequent cleaning of hands, physical distance between individuals, um, every possible way to educate the public about the importance. Obviously, when a particular region determines staying at home is appropriate, um, is a judgment call related to um, are you emerging? And of course, the difficulty here is you emerge weeks after you already have a problem. And I don't know, and maybe Eli does, how good the modeling has really been in terms of indicating um, once you have an index case or two, um, how many other cases you have out there. I've heard 10, I've heard 15, and I don't know how solid the number is, but clearly someone, someone has a, a decent estimate of that. And you don't have to wait too long because the incubation period isn't like, say, HIV, where you know it was months before people would come to the attention of the system and there was no test. Here we have a test. Um, the other question is I cannot answer, the, but I assume the challenges are significant for low and middle income countries in terms of testing. So one of the challenges for Dr. Martin and others in leadership positions like his, I would include all of us on the panel in that, is to advocate for the availability of um, test kits, uh, especially as they become uh, quicker to administer, even self-administered, that this will be very, very important in controlling the epidemic, as will all of the tried and true public health uh, mechanisms, which frankly have been applied, not uniformly, but in many cases in the Asian countries where, uh, the, where this epidemic emerged, and, and they were successful, at least up to this point, 
in sharply curtailing the growth of the epidemic beyond what it would otherwise have been. And I believe the United States would have similarly been able to do just that uh, had it had it, it, at its disposal the right the supply chain of the uh, of the test. And frankly, the boots on the ground in terms of, um, I don't like all these battle analogies, but um, the public health workforce to be, you know, effectively deployed to manage the contact tracing, which, you know, the larger the epidemic becomes, the more formidable a challenge that is, no matter how many test kits you have available. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Hilton. Um, Dr. Holgrave, this question comes from Mohammed, and he makes a, an excellent point that there are many uh, physicians and health workers in the United States who have licenses, valid licenses from other countries. Um, is, do you, are you hearing any sense of that, whether they'll be called up and used uh, in addressing the pandemic? Uh, I think that's a, it's an excellent point, and I think that we are hearing those conversations now. I think that um, uh, being able to uh, utilize persons with uh, licenses from from other areas is incredibly important. Uh, also, we're seeing even just within the U.S., uh, you know, movement from one state to the other. I know in uh, New York City the other day there was a, a plane full of healthcare workers who were coming in, and um, whether it's uh, uh, in upstate New York or New York City or, or other areas of the state, um, the uh, rate of healthcare workers who uh, are, are now becoming infected with the virus is really um, uh, incredible. And we have to be able to figure out uh, how uh, much we can all come together as a team. And so I think this suggestion that uh, Mohammed brings forward is incredibly important. It's becoming a, a, a key point of discussion now, as well as persons who are uh, retired, uh, persons who have um, uh, licenses, they practiced in the past, physicians, nurses, other healthcare professionals. Uh, and uh, as Dr. Fauci uh, says from time to time, it really is an all hands on deck kind of situation at this point, uh, and everyone must come together. So I, I, um, I, I think it's an excellent point, and that's something we must do. Thank you, thank you Dr. Holcrave. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg, this question relates to ventilators, and can you share with us any um, updated information about the national picture with regard to uh, ventilators uh, and the gaps that we currently have? Um, oh, that's a good question. I can't speak for our full national uh, picture, but I can say a few things. One is, um, I think as Liz alluded to earlier in our state, uh, our, at, our, at our state level, we, our governor announced today that we, he estimates about a six-day supply left of ventilators. There is also, there are also federal stockpiles um, uh, available. Though people may have seen today in the New York Times, it was reported that uh, there was a, a lapse in the contract uh, for the upkeep of the federal supply, and many thousands of ventilators that otherwise would have been available are actually inoperable at the moment, which is really um, very disappointing to hear. I don't have the physical number that is available uh, that is that are functional in our national stockpile. I think the other piece is that the, the ability to be able to mobilize and deploy and source new and develop new solutions for ventilators has been a lot of big challenge. There's many efforts underway right now to fill the gap um, that are all being made in the middle of the crisis. Um, and it feels in some sense a little, um, a little late. Uh, so we're really, uh, we're at near the bottom of the barrel, unfortunately, with our ventilator supply, at least from the New York State perspective. Um, and that's a real challenge. Uh, we can increase number of beds, uh, I'd say easily, but a bit, a little bit, somewhat more easily than we could increase the number of ventilators. And as our governor has also pointed out repeatedly in his briefings, we need the, we need the physically qualified medical hands to operate all of this. Um, and that has another resource in short supply. As Dr. Holgrave just said, there's efforts to try to bring more people on board, but the number of ha uh, qualified hands to operate this is really uh, lacking as well. Yeah, no, very, very true, and um, and and that can lead into a, looking into an, a, uh, as part of that, um, uh, Dr. Hilton. Uh, this question comes from Chris, and Chris said, "Well, why is the surge curve in in New York and the U.S. so much different from South Korea and Taiwan? What did they do differently than what the U.S. has done?" Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I think we can all uh, chip in on that uh, answer. But um, one, of, one I've already alluded to, they had broader availability of testing and they utilized it early on. Um, and I also think the fact that they did more what is called population testing 
uh, was very important because for in South Korea, for example, if you look at, I don't think these results are published yet, but they had a 29.9% infection rate among those age 20 to 29, which raises a whole issue right there um, about who's the vector, how many asymptomatic people or pre-symptomatic people are spreading the epidemic. So I think they use testing much better. I think in some cases they use quarantine much better. Certainly China used that. Um, and we're really not at this point doing any population-based testing except, I guess, with the exception of nursing homes. Um, and I'm sure that that is not even widely disseminated yet, though maybe others on the panel can speak to that question. Uh, David or Eli? Uh, yeah, so this is David. I, I'll just uh, say too, I agree with everything that uh, Dean Hilton has said, and um, and just maybe would would add too that I think um, some of the testing strategies in South Korea were uh, very creative. For instance, uh, developing um, uh, these uh, 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 kind of rooms, if you will, that look like telephone booths that were adjoining to each other, and um, at the healthcare provider put their arms through uh, kind of rubber gloves that went through the plastic walls of these like telephone booths, um, performed the swab for the test. Uh, and when the person left the booth on that side, uh, someone else would come in and quickly disinfect that booth. And they would really develop these incredible systems of helping a number of people get tested in, in a creative way and in an uh, efficient way. Um, and then, as Dean Helm said, really using uh, those test results. And, and as I mentioned earlier, not giving up on that testing too, even once cases started going down, um, I think there was a national priority made of making sure to keep testing uh, because you don't know that you've really uh, suppressed the number of cases unless you do keep looking. And I think that was in incredible. And then also the other, it, it was a different kind of physical distancing, I think, in South Korea, um, which was interesting. So many other uh, countries, uh, the U.S., uh, uh, Italy, um, China, a uh, number of other areas have kind of either shut down whole countries or whole cities or whole regions of, of an area. And um, in South Korea, the physical distancing was much more surgically based on the testing information and the contact tracing information and then doing these kind of micro health screenings, like taking people's temperature and a lot of different touch points in society. Um, and uh, because of that, uh, they utilize physical distancing in a different way, but a very important way. So those are a couple of thoughts. And I'll just add one more piece that I think it we uh, I agree with everything that's been said so far, um, but we just need to uh, it may be too early to claim victory in any given location that we really need to think of this in a long in a long longer time frame and that uh, strategies may have been successful for now, but once uh, restrictions lift, travel resumes, business goes back to usual, um, that reintroduction is possible and likely in many locations that have seen victory in the short term and that we need to really uh, think in terms of long-term uh, prevention and public health here. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg. And before we were getting to the end of the, the webinar and um, uh, Dr. Rosenberg, Dr. Holgrave, and Dr. Hilton in that order will close with some final comments. And uh, we'll answer one question that was directed at CUGH from Dr. Jindal. And Dr. Jindal wants to know what CUGH is doing with regard to some institutions that are penalizing and preventing their frontline healthcare workers from uh, accessing the personal protective equipment that they need. So Dr. Jindal, uh, we are asserting with those institutions and in fact nationally that institutions uh, and frontline healthcare workers must be able to be allowed to get the equipment that they need. If their institutions are unable to prevent uh, access to that personal protective equipment, uh, we are strongly advising that they, all healthcare workers, be allowed to get what they need to protect themselves. It's not a reflection on those institutions. We have a national crisis in access to PPE. It is understandable, but uh, we are uh, obviously uh, opposed uh, to any efforts that will prevent healthcare workers from accessing the, P the personal protective equipment they need. So with that, I'll turn it over first to um, Dr. Rosenberg and then Dr. Holgrave and then Dean Hilton will will uh, end and I'll have a closing comment. Uh, sure. Dr. Rosenberg, over to you. 
Sure, yeah, I'll just say that um, I think what's a clear theme even across all of our pieces is that the role of data, um, accurate data, uh, is really important and, and critical to informing our to forming good public health strategies. Models are um, one important element of that. And I'd really uh, discourage sort of focusing on any one given number or any one given projection that may, you may see in a given media source or from a given politician that um, numbers uh, can be used to sort of uh, make specific uh, policy assertions, but we need to look at the full constellation of information. And I think at least what we've seen here pretty clearly in New York is a very consistent message across different um, types of projections that the time to act is now. Um, and we need uh, a very large amount of medical resources and that even after we act in the next few weeks that we're really in this for the long haul and that we really um, need to think about, uh, yeah, this is th that really all locations in our country and in, our, in the world really need to be thinking in terms of a, a long strategy here that's really informed by data and public health action. Thanks, Thank Eli. You, and uh, I, I guess. No, oh, thank you. And uh, I would just uh, maybe add and uh, mention one other topic we haven't uh, touched on too much yet, and that's uh, morbidity as well as mortality. I think uh, if we look at just the, the one IHME model that Eli talked about earlier, um, that puts the uh, total number of deaths in the U.S. at around 90,000 or so, uh, if we take that and just sit very crudely and simply multiply that by the inverse of what the fatality rate looks like right now in the U.S., which is around uh, 1.75 percent, and of course that will change over time, and we could talk a long time about that proper estimation of fatality rates, but if you just do that simple calculation, it would imply that by the end of the summer, the total number of cases in the U.S. will have probably reached at about four and a half million. Now, of course, there's lots of uncertainty around that, and I wouldn't bet on exactly four and a half million. But I, the point is, of course, that the we often talk about the back end of this epidemic, the fatalities, uh, the number of people admitted to the ICU, which is an incredibly important priority, uh, and where we need to have that focus. Um, but there's so many people who will get uh, sick and the disease seems to be quite substantial for many people. And of course, some people resolve and have mild symptoms. But I've just started to begin to think about um, how will we calculate the, the uh, total burden of disease in terms of qualities and dallies and so on. And I think it's really quite substantial. So as we think about mortality issues, um, I think we also just need to keep in mind uh, the morbidity issues around this as well, too. And of course, uh, I'll end with uh, what Dr. Fauci said earlier, we don't have to be prepared to accept those numbers of deaths and extent to say we don't have to be prepared to accept the amount of morbidity that we would be talking about here as well, too. So, Dean Hilton, I'll turn it to you for the last one. Well, I would just, following on that concept, um, and I, I think I heard you say 4 million, um, 4 million infections, 4 million positive cases, right? Uh, 4 million positive cases, yeah. You think about that and you and you you add 1.7 percent to it or even if you want to be optimistic and say 0.5 percent uh you you get a sense of the uh, burden of fatality that's sitting there and because it's only four million infections that come that are become known to us the question is how many um were asymptomatically infected and um did not have sufficient symptoms to come to the system's attention. So the bottom line of the problem that that kind of implies is exactly what I think Eli said earlier. This is not going to be a one wave epidemic. What we're doing is we're suppressing it for the sake of the capacity of the healthcare system to the maximum extent we can. But unless some small miracle happens, we're going to see repeated repeated hotspots all over the place um, until such time as we have effective treatments effective testing, effective separation of positives from negatives. It's a, it's a short-term separation and ultimately a vaccine. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dean Hilton, Dean Holgrave, and Professor Rosenberg for lending your expertise during this time of great urgency in the country. I'd also like to thank Jenna Smith, who from CUGH produces these webinars. And to all of you online, we really need the federal government to assert its leadership responsibility to work with the states, use FEMA, use the Defense Production Act 
so that the states can get access to the personal protective equipment, the um, ICU equipment and ventilators, the places to quarantine, the testing and the people, we need to fight this war against COVID-19. We cannot let up in this battle. We must, as Dr. Hilton said, plan now, staff now, and equip now. And as Dr. Holcrave said, we do not have to accept 100,000 deaths. We can do better, and we must do better. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.